Hi. Uh, today we have with us Anthony Mary, Senior Director of Product Management and Product Marketing at Sophos. Anthony joined Sophos in 2014 and has performed several roles since, including that of Product Management for Endpoint and Encryption Products and Product Marketing. He brings more than 28 years of IT experience and holds extensive knowledge of cybersecurity, products, and solutions. Today, Anthony is going to talk about the EDR, MDR, and XDR markets. So without wasting any more time, let's get into a quick chat with Anthony. Anthony, uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to you from the Digital Tech Media team. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, having me today. All right. So first up, you know, we'd like to know, you know, how do you, uh, how do EDR, MDR and XDR really differ in terms of costs and complexity? Well, each cater to different levels of cybersecurity per means. device. And then you also have some staff costs because it's managed in-house. So there may also be some training and deployment costs associated with it. On the complexity side, it does require the in-house team to configure and to monitor the product of choice. And it can provide some fine-grained controls, which could add to the complexity of management. Moving on to XDR, well, it has similar costs to EDR, but it can increase in investment if additional security tools are needed. So open XDR platforms, they allow customers to ingest security telemetry from tools that they've already invested in. Uh, that may come with additional costs, depending on the vendor that you've chosen. They tend to be priced by user or per device. And as I mentioned, those additional costs could be for data ingestion and data storage. Now, staff costs are also included or should be included in this because it's managed in-house or if it's managed by an MSSP, there may be additional costs on top. Uh, complexities, well, it can simplify the overall security management if you can place everything and you, multiple, and you uh, consolidate those multiple data sources into a single pane of glass. The complexity lies in that integration of the various security tools and the data sources, but it also requires some very skilled individuals or partnerships with an MSSP, for example, uh, to have effective detection, investigation and response. And those costs can increase if you need to provide 24 by 7 coverage, coverage on weekends, public holidays, whatever you need to do. But that's why a lot of customers start looking at MDR. So it tends to have higher initial costs to pay for the service. It is priced per user or per device with additional costs, just like XDR for data ingestion and data storage. And you also have potential additional costs for incident response and other optional service add-ons. The complexity comes, not really complexity, but it's a reduction in complexity for in-house teams because they're not having to do that investigation, detection, and response themselves. So that does, excuse me, give an organization a chance to reduce their investment on in-house teams. They may deploy them to do something else, focus on anything that's important to the business because they're not having to do that detection and response anymore. They may just be doing some monitoring, maybe some reporting. But also both MDR and XDR can help reduce other costs, for example, cyber insurance premiums, if you want to go that route as well. All right. Thank you uh, so much for that explanation. Anthony, uh, how do you know organizations really consolidate the EDR, MDR and XDR solutions to improve their security posture? Can you share some uh, you know, use cases related to the same? Well, I'll... Um... I'll give you one example of an MDR use case, and uh, I really like this one because it actually shows why you need to do threat hunting and why you need information from multiple security products to look at this. So as this particular example, um, SOFOS MDR, an analyst conducted a proactive threat hunt uh, related to a known DPRK threat group. And what they discovered was a fake IT worker within this particular customer's environment. Now that's a bad thing. And so they also discovered that that user persistently logged in using a suspicious VPN not used by other employees in the company. So what you should note at this point is it's not setting off detections like an endpoint detection or anything else like this. Um, it's nothing that's generating a lot of activity if you're not looking for it. And they also then notice an attempted login blocked by Microsoft 365 con uh, conditional access policy that identified that the user was located in, let's just say, a not very friendly country. And this user had been posing as a remote software developer for the company for approximately six months, which is you know, a high risk period. Now, following the analysis of that user's login activity, uh, the team investigated that that employee also had gained highly privileged access to the organization's AWS cloud environment. 
So then they then contacted the customer, alerted them to this activity, got on a live conference call, provided guidance and next steps, and very shortly after that, the customers had uh, basically disabled the user account, locking them out. So that, that's one example, and I'll give you another quick example uh, very quickly. And again, this shows why you need to have additional telemetry from other products. Now, in this example, the customer used the Sophos MDR service, and they also used Mimecast for their email protection. And so what the Mimecast product showed was a suspicious URL was included in an email to, uh, to an employee at the company. By itself, you probably know as well as I do, that happens all the time. I get a lot of it in my personal and work emails. Uh, but what they then did was they did a search across the entire estate using information from the email to, to look at had anyone actually clicked on it. And well, they found a user that had. They went and had a look at the process data, uncovered that the user had accessed the URL directly from Outlook. It opened Microsoft Edge. It then downloaded and deleted a suspicious PDF. And so at that point, uh, the Sophos MDR team contacted the customer, recommended that they deleted the spear phishing email in this case, and also look for it in other email boxes in the organization, blacklist the sender, and just move on from there. So th those are two very quick examples of why it's actually good to uh, use something like an MDR, or you can do exactly the same thing with XDR and your appropriate security teams, and that's how they improve a company's security posture. All right. So if uh, an organization was to choose any one solution or um, maybe a combination, so how does an organization really decide which of these solutions is best for them? Well, it depends on the capabilities of the organization, if I just answer very simply. Uh, if, if we look at the industry as a whole, and I'll be very, very generic here, cybersecurity has become too complex and changes too fast to be effectively managed by most organizations alone. Increase that with modern threats are increasingly sophisticated. They evade traditional security tools and technologies, and that necessitates that organizations have human-led visibility over their entire cybersecurity ecosystem. Now, that just means that it pushes them towards EDR, XDR, MDR, instead of using something traditional like Endpoint. Now, where most organizations, they tend to look at what's the cost of XDR, what's the cost of MDR. I leave off EDR because in my mind, EDR and XDR are practically the same. The only thing that differs is XDR sees everything across your ecosystem. EDR focuses on endpoints and servers. Now, most organizations look at the cost difference between XDR and EDR. They'll try and do it themselves. And after a while, they'll find that if they don't have a team which is secure as basically staff, they know what they're doing, they are capable, they have all the knowledge, they have access to threat intelligence, then they just find it way too hard. So that's when they tend to go and look at an MDR service. Now, if I simplify that, essentially, if your organization lacks the resources and expertise to detect and respond to attacks 24 by 7, just look at MDR because you'll find XDR too complicated. Right. Um, uh, now, the, there, you know, uh, Anthony, there are much talks around a generative AI, and it has already become a huge technology and is will continue to, you know, uh, increase and rise in the future. I wanted to understand, you know, how can organization ensure enhanced threat detection using generative AI? Yeah, well, I, I look at AI in general here. So it's more than just generative AI. Generative AI is the latest uh, hype. It's the latest buzzword. Uh, but you should look at how you're using AI, what your provider is providing that gives AI functionality and how it's being used, but more importantly, how does it benefit you? So it shouldn't be there to replace humans. It should be there to empower your team to support their investigation and detection and response efforts. So that's what any AI, whether it is the traditional you know, machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, or generative AI, it should be there to help focus and empower your security team, your security analysts, to neutralize adversaries faster. Now, this could be anything, and I'll just give you two examples, but I could list quite a few on and on and on. Uh, it might want to do a case summary for you, and this is specifically looking at generative AI. Here is a list of detections. It may come from multiple security products, my endpoint, my firewall, my email solution, uh, the identity information from Microsoft. 
can generative AI have a look at all those detections and tell me in a quick summary, what do they all mean? What do they think the attacker is trying to do? What ties it all together and what should be the next steps? So that's like a summary of what this case is, what's the investigation, what should the analyst focus their time on? Again, focusing on how do you make an analyst more productive? And once they start that investigation, and again, I'll just give one more example here, you know, active adversaries, they obfuscate their commands, they hide what they're trying to do. So you might take a command that was executed, and obviously in this case, in this example, it's an obfuscated command. So you can ask AI, hey, can you de-obfuscate this for me to show me the command that was actually executed and explain to me or help me understand what the attacker was trying to do with this particular command? Again, all of this goes back to how do you make a security analysts faster at their job so that they can detect and stop and eject an attacker in the shortest possible time. Right. I think you rightly mentioned any technology should empower an organization and generative AI is no different. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much for speaking to us. We really enjoyed this conversation. Look forward My to having you. My pleasure. Thanks.